Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Colors. Yeah. It's the trim right. I can't I know. See. I got... Yeah. 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 Okay, good afternoon. We are here a little past our time, but it is 3.40, I'll say, 3.39. Um, and we're called to order. This meeting is also going to be live streamed and available for viewing at msad11.org under the curriculum committee. And we have lots of things to go through. So I will pass it to Ms. Why everyone introduce themselves? Oh, sure. <laughs> Everybody goes that way, Jim, so I'm going this way. All right, Whoa. sir, you can start. Oh, thank you. I'm not used to this. Uh, uh, Tony V. Gardner. <laughs> Alyssa Tracy. Megan Carlson. Diane Potter. Jim Lothridge. Thank you. And Angela Hardy, Director of Curriculum. Excellent. Thank you. Now we're ready. Now we're ready. <laughs> OK. Um, today is the first meeting of this school year. So we typically go through uh, a number of different items just to make sure you're part of that you understand what we're planning on doing this year, how this works. And then we also reserve a little bit of time at the end of the meeting uh, for you to indicate areas of interest that you would like to learn more about as a member of the curriculum committee so that I can plan for that in future meetings. So be thinking about that. Um, so we're going to start with the first agenda item, which is the professional learning plan. I'm going to share a couple things on the screen. Oh, that's still not fantastic, but we'll go with it. Um, hang on, I got lost. 
I think we can go even bigger. I was going to say, if you want, you can probably. There we go. Yeah. Hide so that there's a lot to this. So I just wanted to kind of give you an overview and then we'll dive into the act some other content. But basically, we create a schedule for the year based on what you approve in the district calendar for workshop days and early release time. We tie it in with our district goals and themes or trends that are coming up that need some professional learning experiences. So I actually have this set up across two tabs or in the handout, the big color coded handout, the first tab is elementary or the first page or the top is elementary and the second is yeah. secondary. was our first workshop day. And then it proceeds from left to right across the year. And what you'll see is like when everyone's together, it's yellow, when it's a building based time and principals are going to really focus in on just their building staff, it's orange, it's green where there's some content specific, it's purple when it's special education, um, and white when it's other. So for example, just so you know how we started our year, we all started with convocation from 8 to 9.30 and at last week's board meeting, the presentation I shared around district roles and strategic learning plan was part of that. Um, the building staff had time to work in their own buildings and with their leadership teams on specific goals and practices they were working on. Our elementary staff had training on math progression, specifically on base 10 numeration and place value, because it's an area of concern for us um, that we want to just continue to hone our skills and how to teach students, because it's that's a, a lagging point in our student data. Um, our special education staff had specialized training in math, in our assessment tool, in our new curriculum that you adopted last year, and in our safety practices. Um, and in our literacy practices for special ed. And then um, we also had word study training. Um, it's an area in our literacy programming at the elementary level that we're noticing there was a gap. The second grade, there is not a gap based on the materials we have, but there, um, in K-1, it was just a refinement of practice and three through five, there was a significant gap. So we, we went to, we've developed um, a, a scope and sequence to close that gap um, and train teachers on how to use it, something they've been asking for. So we did that over the summer um, called advanced word study, We're using the up, most up-to-date research-based practices um, that indicate that students will learn it more efficiently. So we hope they do. We've had library training um, consistently, including keyboarding. Remember, you have a policy that we teach handwriting, uh, pre-K, K, first grade and second grade. We teach cursive in third grade and we teach keyboarding in fourth grade. So we're just launching that this year. You talk, when you say keyboarding, you're actually working on a keyboard. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep, actual sequence of lessons. Um, and so based on the research and what you approved, um, it seems like fourth grade was the right time to start to institute that. Um, so that training went into place this year so that we can implement it with students in a strategic way. And then, um, and then this just continues. So you'll see that we have every single workshop day and early release period. Um, and the focus areas include learning themes, which we're going to talk about shortly, a balance of district needs and building-based needs, a focus here on um, managing anxiety um, with our Gasoline Lions through Uni the United Ways grant, some deep training. Um, and then these gray is early release parent teacher conferences. Uh, we, have an, we have audit training all year for our special education staff. Um, a couple of the early releases are dedicated specifically to buildings. And then continuous learning themes all year. Um, we are developing still March 15th as the workshop day. Uh, I just want to, I like to have a little bit of time that's responsive to what's coming up across the year. So I tried to create some space for that. Um, 
data analysis really starts in May as the assessment season winds down. Um, and then June is usually wrapping everything up. At the secondary level, this looks a lot the, very similar, except for we implemented a new, it's called Smart Pass, um, which is like a yeah. hallway management kind of software yeah. program at the high school. Um, so there's been lots of training for staff and then two weeks of training with students and it just launched this week. Um, and uh, also tracking and monitoring student uh, behavior just differently um, than we than we had been doing it. Okay. I'm sorry. The monitoring system. Do, do the students have a pass they carry? Yeah, or, it's all electronic. It's I knew that, but the, I mean, is there something that is got a transponder in it or something? Or no, it's um, it's determined between computer systems. Either the teacher has or the student's phone eventually, um, if they have a phone. But it's basically there's a way to log how many available passes there are and match them to student names. So if a student's in a hallway, they should be in a hallway with an electronic pass in the system and it's approved. So we know where they're going, why they're going there. And who monitors that? Or is it everybody monitor? A All the bit? faculty and administration. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a newer technology. It's new for everyone to, um, but it, it ensures that students can still use the bathroom and get the snacks they need and all that, but it's just managed in ways that we haven't really had it managed before. The scuttlebutt is they think the new principal brought it with her. They do. And I'm like, no, actually. Um, <laughs> Whatever. I, I think, it was already <laughs> coming. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've had ongoing questions right. um, for a long time, especially, you know, when you're trying to... There should be student movement in a, in to some degree because we have open campus right. for students with special, per, you know, honors mm -hmm. privileges. Um, right. But it's just about, is it purposeful? Mm -hmm. Are you purposefully moving about mm -hmm. or are you avoiding something? Right, right. <laughs> or lingering, um, where you shouldn't mm -hmm. be lingering, right? Yeah, yeah and yeah. sometimes that's where incidents occur. A frequency of incidents is when we have a little too much leisure time when we're supposed to be in purposeful learning time. Does it detect or figure out something if a child is hiding in the bathroom? It won't do that, but if, if the child is gone for longer than the set period of time, the system will That's what I'm getting. make someone I know, know no that. Monitors in the bathrooms, but yep. at least- Yeah, it's, it's like there's certain time periods where like how much time is allotted for the bathroom and how much time is allotted for going to get a drink of water. And, um, and some of it will be adjusted as they practice using it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's a good question. Um, we've, we, uh, a couple big things that happened in the secondary, which is six through 12. We brought in Joe Schmidt, who um, was the main department of ed, social studies, um, uh, content area specialist for a number of years. He, he came from Wisconsin. Um, and he now works for the National Bill of Rights Institute, and he lives in Maine, so we're lucky about that. And he wrote a book called Civil Discourse, and uh, he co-wrote it during the pandemic. Uh, so he came in for three hours and worked with all of our staff in 6 through 12 on um, civil discourse in the classroom and the school community and how you set the stage for that and why it's important and then what strategies you can use to to enable a, a productive and effective series of conversations around sensitive topics um, without it being um, a conflict. Um, and so we want that for all our students and staff, right? So we started that three hour process. And then one of the learning themes is for those interested, we've purchased the, using grant money, we've purchased the books and, and the discussion guide, and we'll have a series of um, like in-depth conversations and um, approaches to trying this in our schools and classrooms across the year, um, using that as a guide. So, um, we also have Common Lit Training, which is really, it's an online platform for authentic um, literature um, that's leveled for students and, and has audio versions as well that can be applied directly to classroom experiences. It'll probably be most impactful in English and social studies. Um, we released Newzella, which is a license we had 
um, the, the rate for the license increased drastically over the last couple of years the, and not enough usage to warrant the cost. And so we went, this is a nonprofit group and it's very reputable and it's been around a long time. So we've shifted to common lit. Um, we do need to come up with a tool that's a little bit more aligned to si the science educators so that they have some um, level of materials. Um, and then you'll see kind of the same sort of theme K that was in K-5 carry through 612. And that's like a focus on the, um, managing anxiety, um, opportunities for building base time, and then those learning themes that we're gonna go into. Couple new things in six through 12, um, we have a what's called a panorama survey. Panorama is a company and they'll be, we'll be conducting a survey um, in the fall and spring with students and another one with staff. And it's really just to elevate the voices of the students and staff to ensure that they have an opportunity to answer a whole series of questions related to their learning environment, teaching and learning, relationships and belonging in the school community. And then we'll use that data to work with a building wide committee to think through, okay, what does this mean? Where are we strong? How do we want to improve? How do we develop a plan for doing that? And then by having a spring survey, we can see if any of the short term measures actually led to improvement, right? And then we'll keep doing that. So that will be at the middle school and the high school. Um, and there's all kinds of privacy features so that, you know, data is not widely shared and that kind of thing or um, connected to an individual for a large group of people. Um, the other thing we're doing that's pretty big is um, sources of strength training, which I've talked about previously, but that is um, a training that helps with mental health messaging and suicide prevention using peer-to-peer uh, -peer language and campaigns. So you train staff in both the middle school and the high school, then you train students from each school that are interested and want to be part of the becoming a peer leader. And then they meet routinely throughout the year to develop like messaging campaigns about wellness and health based on what they've learned, resources available to students, how to notice if someone is struggling and then to connect that someone to a, an adult who can help. So not putting the pressure on the youth to solve that person's problem, but building those connectors, right? Um, that training is happening in October and we're doing that in partnership with the healthy communities of the capital area and their grant funds. Um, and the other big thing is, and this is a, the, the date is on hold because um, Jake Kula is on, on medical leave at the moment, but when he returns, we're looking for a time that works for him. He'll come from the um, Office of the Attorney General and the Civil Rights Program to do challenging bias and harassment in our schools. So that will tie in nicely with the civil discourse mm -hmm. and the panorama data, data about belonging and um, respectful conversations and civil dialogue in schools. So really this is about all students, ensuring all students are in a safe space for learning. Um, it's not, you know, favoring any one group, but ensuring everyone has equal opportunity and a, to appropriately engage in their learning safely. Well, that with the anxiety items too, right. is like, just feels like perfect mix. Yeah, we're really yeah. trying to weave it together. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I like the sense that it's spread out over the year. It mm -hmm. looks yeah, like. right. Yeah, right. Totally. There's an arc. That's a Trying lot. not to have it be one and done. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> ongoing. Great space for that. So that's like the big picture. And I know it's a little awkward to look at it this way <laughs> um, in all these color coded cells. So I will share a different document that will get into the learning theme. So it might be a little bit more instructive to you. So learning themes are something we started last year, although I think they've, they've sort of been done before. Um, so it's not like this brand new novel. Oops, let's try that again. Learning themes, novel concept. Um, the idea is to create professional learning that's ongoing 
embedded in their job, like the day that their contract hours, meaningful to the staff member. So there's some opportunity for choice, right? That will help them continue to evolve as an educator in our system, given the context in which we're working. It's not perfect because ideally, if everyone had equal amount of choice, we'd have more options than I'm going to present to you. Some of these options are based on need in certain areas, including teacher identified need, not just my identified need. And so it reduces option, but it's because of some language that came up earlier by staff. Does that make sense? So it's almost like a predetermined learning theme because of prior information that I gathered. So as you can see on this stapled page, which is also on the screen, I'll make it a little bigger. Um, I try not to take every single professional learning period of time that we have because yeah. There are building goals, right? And building needs. Um, so it's, it's about an hour and a half routinely throughout the year. They don't launch until October on purpose um, because August is just mired in how do we start our year with anything that's new, right? And so um, this will, this has not gone out yet. It'll go out, um, in a week, about a week, a little, a little over a week. Um, to staff, once we finish, you'll see there's a few hanging pieces. For them to review the time commitment, they'll have an opportunity to, to use a form to register for a theme so that I can make sure we have enough materials and resources available. And if for any reason, one of these themes really just doesn't resonate with someone, which could happen, Right. There could be a, an art teacher that's like, this just isn't, this isn't, none of these really work for me. Although this year I feel like we did a better job. But in that case, there is a proposal form that they could can complete a proposal to their administrator to say, this is how I would use the learning themes time with whom and for what purpose. Um, it has to go through an approval process. Um, so it's not just anyone can do that, but um, we certainly, there's always an exception to the rule, so we're trying to create space for that. And then these are the themes that are in this stapled packet. You'll see the descriptions are not all here because they're due this Friday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just decided you could see it anyway. <laughs> um, the first one is the learning environment, supporting a positive community. So we've done a lot of work on elements of effective instruction across our schools or just starting that work. <laughs> one of the elements is the learning environment. So if someone really wants to work on really thinking about that um, sense of belonging, the routines and procedures that you use with students to build independence and, and agency, um, classroom structures, stuff like that, this is a great one for someone to lean into. The next one is building off the work with Lynn Lyons. So it's called Managing Anxiety to Support Inclusive Engaged Classrooms and Schools. So it's for all roles. Um, we are going to use a couple different texts and then I'll probably turn the groups into two smaller groups based on who signs up for it and what they'd like to use. But we're going to, through the grant, we're going to purchase the anxiety audit by Lynn Lyons. And that's really a personal audit. It's and and thinking about how that plays out with um, other people in your life. And so for educators, they can think about how that also plays out for their classroom community. And then the other one is called Anxious Kids, Anxious Parents, Seven Ways to Stop the Worry Cycle and Raise Courageous and Independent Children. I anticipate our social workers, our school counselors, maybe nurses and ad administrators will probably pick the second one um, more than the first one because that's their interface, right? They work most with families and, stu and students. So there might be some real value there. There is a children's book that I can purchase that goes with this particular text. And I may be doing that as well to cre create some language between students and service providers. Um, so that's, that's something so that we carry forward all year long, including classroom teachers, ed techs, anyone may find that they want to enter and learn more than what they can learn through the October learning sessions. 
The other one is following up on civil discourse. So that's that book discussion. Um, so that's outlined here. Um, we, have a, we have a discussion guide and I already have staff who have signed up more staff will sign up after this launches, but what I did is I created space right after the training for them to sign up because some people wanted the book right away. So I've already sent them the book. Mm -hmm. um, and then I said, if this really interests you and you wanna co-facilitate the book discussion, sign up for that. So I have a number of staff members who wanna do that. They'll meet with me ahead of time. We'll go through and plan what it will look like and then they'll leave it with their peers. So that's kind of exciting. Your header here, you just want to update. Too. Oh, shoot. Yes. Only because I was just in editing earlier today. And Good catch. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Someone always catches that later. Yeah, it's all good, but that's why you have templates. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, this next one, MTSS, that's that intervention system we refined last year. Um, tier one is what we call core instruction. It's what happens in the classroom. Tier three is in our world is more like pull out intervention. So title one, learning lab, reach. So tier two is what does a teacher do when the core instruction isn't working, but they're not quite at the time that they need an extra adult to support them outside the classroom. And there's a, we've developed all kinds of plans on how to do that. And some people wanna get better at it. So this is like a time where that this is actually almost fleshed out. I just didn't put it in because I knew it would be public consumption, but um, on, on a kind of how to focus on that. The next one, we're working with Maine Math and Science Alliance specialist, Dr. Kate Cook. She'll be working with the high school science team. We had one of their other specialists work with the middle school team all last year. We're just trying to make sure our science, our science practices are up to the most relevant um, expectations now around, like, there's a lot of shifts expected in science education. If you think back to like Sputnik, there were a lot of shifts in right, science education then. And then kind of more recently, there's been another kind of round of shifts and making sure our curriculum is aligning to those expectations and giving the staff time to like really learn about it and think about what that means for instruction and build some plans around that with a specialist. Have we updated our science curriculum in the last four or five years? No, so um, it's due. So the elementary team will start meeting with me in November. The middle school team is in an ongoing um, process of adjustments, right? That started last year. And the high school team will launch from this training to do that. And then we'll sync them all up K to 12. The one thing, the reason I asked that I was, I brought it to Pat's attention. When I first got on the board, I was substituting up until I became a board member. And I substituted in a class where I had to do a, I did a video presentation. It was Mr. Wizard. I used to watch Mr. Wizard when I was <laughs> preteen. And the items that they had us, that it was showing there, if any teacher in our district ever did that particular project, they should be fired. And was that had, in a different district you were substituting? A, <laughs> just a little disclaimer underneath, do not do this in your classroom. And that was the only thing. But I would really, if we're, if anything happened before I get off the board, which is pretty quick, I would really like to see us look at some new current up-to-date assisted curriculum, you know, so th these were just not the actual curriculum. It was just to reinforce learning. I actually remember it was on vectors. I remember that. I will say we actually have some really phenomenal science teachers all the way through the system. Um, we are really shifting into this like inquiry based science mm -hmm. um, now known as phenomena based science. I'll spare the Muppet song for you. Yeah. Yeah. Please. <laughs> And um, there's some really neat things like, you know, our ninth grade earth science program is now, you know, there's an indoor version, but there's it's predominantly out, outdoor version mm. available too through Sharon Glant's work. Um, that's made it more relevant and hands-on. It's using our local resources to really actually apply, learn and apply our science. Um, there's been some uh, kind of neat work in the chemistry field about use like 
understanding how solo stoves work, you know, those, um, mm. you know, things that like the kids are seeing in front of them all the mm. time now under analyzing, um, ticks through mm. new testing procedures. So, I mean, that's highly relevant that to our fun. students, right? Who's not doing a tick check daily. So, mm. um, the, there's some really neat things happening. It's just trying to get it so that our that students are building year over year towards these practices, right? Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so that's science. Um, middle school will still have some connections with Maine Mouth and Science Alliance, just not every single time. They'll they'll the middle school science crew. Um, we really are trying to design something specifically for our ed techs or our paraprofessionals. Um, they're asking for it. And so we, these little check marks are things they've asked for specifically. So that's not the full description. Um, it's our working draft. Uh, but Dr. Sims will help with that. Um, our math coach will be working with grades five to eight math teachers. There's a real uh, need and desire to work together and especially to build that fifth to sixth grade bridge in math. So that team will work together. Grades three to five, small group reading instruction. There'll be a real focus on that. It's a practice that we're not as used to doing. Small group instruction in grades three through five. We do it in kindergarten to second grade all the time. So we have resources to help staff learn and do that more routinely based on student data. Um, the middle school is really developing a writing rubric and grammar scope and sequence in literacy and building a sustained reading initiative across the building. So they're gonna work on some curriculum work there. And kindergarten, first grade and second grade have asked for team-based time because we, are, we have a curriculum now, but what we really want is how is the implementation process going and then we need to set benchmark by trimester expectations instead of a year end expect instead of only year end expectations, mm -hmm. and then um, some of those like quick formative ch uh, quick checks on student learning. Some of those need to be developed a little bit, and then how is it really going? And to do that across the whole grade level with a team of teachers is nearly impossible because we're four buildings. Mm -hmm. So this gives like dedicated time routinely with those people without having to go 45 minutes after school, right? right? Which mm -hmm. you can't get almost anything done in 45 minutes. Yeah. Right. Um, so really trying to hone in there because they've had their curriculum the longest, but the benchmarks is what we're seeing now that we have new report cards. We're like, ooh, the benchmarks, ways to help them feel supported in their practice. And then lastly, we're not doing it during the learning themes because we don't have time. <laughs> uh, but we are going to secure subs and work with Maine Math and Science Alliance math specialists. Sorry, I think Oops. we switched on the paper and then. Thank you. Doom, 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 doom. Oh, yep, there you go. Here we go. Right here. Yep. Um, with Julia McDonald Plum, we'll work with our grade three team. This has nothing to do with the teachers, mind you. This is because grade three data. Right consistently falls in our district and we've got to figure out why mm. and and it's been like forever <laughs> and we've had lots of different teachers in that mix right so it's not a teacher issue it is the complex so i've talked a lot to our math coach about this and our math specialists it's the complexity that changes from second grade to third grade you know it's if you really don't know Mm. base 10 mm. and place value and you get into third grade it's really hard like if word you're problems not, and yeah stuff, if you're right? not flexible with numbers mm. like you can't manipulate them flexibly in your head third grade becomes really hard because now the numbers are getting bigger you're adding more you're subtracting more and now you're multiplying and then you know like mm. there's just so many layers mm. so we're going to work with a specialist around fact fluency which is not speed. It's, it's flexible manipulation of numbers and the strategies that help you do that. In the old, like when I was a kid, the chart, right? Mad minutes, yeah, right? That yeah. was, or around the world, that yeah. was fact fluency. Yeah. 
how quickly can you do it? Right, right. But that's actually not fluency. That's just quick recall. Fluency is a flexible manipulation of numbers. And so between that and some of the other, we're going to analyze some of the other data and try some new things with students that might help them feel stronger as math students, specifically in third grade. Because if we do this, in th we always pick, these students always rise back up in fourth grade and then sort of drop in fifth and drop in seventh. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is like, if we can figure out the third grade, then that releases the pressure on fourth grade. And they can, instead of trying to catch kids up, they can just move through fourth grade, which might make fifth grade more solid, right? And break the cycle. Do you track that by students? In other words, the students that had the learning loss in from second grade to third grade, are they the same ones that are having the learning loss I think you said fifth to sixth, and I miss. And it, yeah, so we track it lots of ways. That. We track it holistically by cohort, the mm -hmm. same group of students going through the years. Then we track it just by grade level, different groups of students at that year. Is the pattern similar? And then we just started recently tracking like groups that are significantly challenged. What's that look like for them year over year? But what we're finding is that you might have this core group, right? We've got to figure out that core group and help them be more successful earlier. So it doesn't keep just widening as they go through the years. But then there's this other group of students that keep flexing up and down. So they're like in both groups almost. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. And so we've, that's the nut to crack. That's what we've got to figure out. So that's something that, does that happen in all levels? It happens different in schools. I'm yeah, talking. it happens in other districts. A lot of times it's second grade for a number of other districts. We've been trying to figure out why it's third grade. So we've been really looking at, you know, what resources have we been using? How does that line up to the grade level standards? How does it line up to our, you know, ongoing data? <laughs> I don't know that there's a hundred percent accuracy in the analysis, but we're, I think our theory of action is getting stronger every year. <laughs> Did yeah. the, the the grade three teachers know this is coming and have embraced okay. it or will they see this soon and then maybe have some back and forth? So they know that there's a concern, but it's not about them as people. Yeah, right, right. Um, no, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Just that this is going to be some and other I've, duties. Yeah, kind of I've thing. done this before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've done this yeah. with other groups before. We've actually did this with grade three five years ago, with a, which was almost a whole different group of teachers. Yeah. Um, because, but then like, and we started to make gains and then COVID and, you know, yeah, so things, now we're just yeah. resetting the administration has already seen all this and agreed to it and started checking in. Lindsay's checked in, but like embracing that we need to do the time now so that we can try to create the change. Yeah. Yeah. And trying to make sure they don't have to like do it outside of school. The challenge is they will have to still come up with sub plans. So that's, gotcha. that's always a challenge for anyone. No, yeah, not the teachers. I mean, like the grade level, that yeah. the impacts and so forth, like you just described. Great. Yeah. 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 Try and stretch it out so it's not like always on top of them, right? Like right. the idea is they can do some, there'll be some time for planning in this session. They learn together, they try some things, they plan, and then they can go work on it for a few weeks Yeah, and come back and do it so that they don't have to learn for six hours and then try to figure out what they're going to do like with it. Rush. Like it's embedded yeah. in the six hours. Nice. So um, a couple of things we still need to do. We have safety care refresher training. That's a mandatory training for our safety teams. Um, I have an, another person being going to the train the trainer. She went this week. Um, so then we can run more trainings because we'll have more trainers in the district. And then lastly, um, part of our grant with uh, part of our grant work with Title II um, is having this committee for this year at the high school level um, that because of the stuff, you know, some incidents that came up last year, we also have new leadership. And so trying to make sure she doesn't feel like she has everything on her shoulders in her very first year with us in a district mm -hmm. is creating some of that shared ownership over this. So we're bringing a committee together that will be in, it has not been determined who, <laughs> just that it will include an, a district administrator, at least one building administrator, um, if not more than one, um, teachers, support staff, hopefully a board member, a 
a community member, and students, um, student representatives. And that, and they won't meet all the time, but a number of times in the year, they'll use the Panorama student and staff survey data to help them think through what is this telling us? What is the district already doing to provide professional learning and student learning? Um, I didn't get into student learning, but we can talk about that another time. Um, around civil discourse and around challenging bias and harassment and around online safety. And then, um, and then say what else can and should we be doing and developing a plan that can be brought forth. And then also anything that's short term, they can then use the spring data to see if there's growth. So like having an oversight group um, that the principal's part of, but the meetings are actually facilitated by someone outside our district who's being paid to like take the to time do, to look yeah. at the information, facilitate, mm -hmm. take notes, Great. <laughs> you know, yeah, so that that part that doesn't done, sit yeah. on the one principal who's mm -hmm. brand new and trying to figure it out. Because, yeah. um, you know, that's the stuff that like takes all the kinds of time, but, mm -hmm. um, and you want to keep the ball moving. Right. So this is the plan. What are your thoughts? <laughs> Well, this this last part it sounds excellent, and I'm I'm all for it. But um, I noted I I noted that at the meeting we had about the flag issue and everything, um, our student rep said that she experiences um, slurs on the bus. The bus is part of our campus, really, mm -hmm. um, and this is great. And I know you have to do some take some time to think about some things, but I suspect a lot of kids, if she is, lots of kids are hearing this sort of thing. Not just that, not just racial, but all kinds of things. And I just don't see how we can put up with it. So I hear you. What I didn't share was the whole student lens, right? So the work around civil discourse will feed into the school-based practices in classrooms so that that shifts the way in which we train students how to engage in conversations at the classroom level. The, the small work, like even Smart Pass, changing our leisure time in the high school will change our formal and informal opportunities for dialogue um, and oversight of that dialogue. <laughs> um, the work we're doing around, um, she's resetting expectations in the building. So they did a lot of work around, in their advisories already around um, setting norms or agreements about mm -hmm. how we communicate and work with one another. And those were done within advisories. And then Lauren is connect, collecting that evidence and creating a collective unified um, set of agreements that would be posted widely and, and taught how to adhere to. Um, it's not that that didn't exist. It's just we're resetting expectations and making sure the students are part of that. Um, the work um, at the end of the month, we're having um, Homeland Security and the State Trooper Group coming in to do work on online um, bullying and mm -hmm. and picture sharing. There's mm -hmm. another word for it, but yeah. that's all I can think of right now. Or like thrill share or whatever the heck. Yeah. The, so the, like yeah. what what are why is that why is it dangerous? Why is it inappropriate? Why is it not civil? <laughs> um and right. and what are what are the consequences of it? Increased anxiety, uh, just uh, um reduction in healthy relationships, a feeling of a lack of belonging and safety. Um, uh, you know, and, and here are the actual consequences legally for you mm -hmm. <laughs> when you do right. these things. Um, and so that they only work in small groups. They don't do the whole school at once in the because it, it doesn't work. Right. So um, those sessions will be the end of the month and they will be with the high school students across the student body over time that week and with the middle school students. Oh, cool. um, so that's another layer that we're adding in. We have Red Ribbon Week coming up and we're adding in mm -hmm. some other layers to it that relate to, with healthy communities of capital area that will relate to appropriate language and discourse. Um, there is the work on that Jake Kula is doing when he returns 
on challenging bias and harassment in schools will help our staff be better able to respond and communicate, but that will also tie into civil rights training. We have the main youth action network that's going to be working with our peer leaders from across all the different types of student groups, not just athletics, not just um, civil rights, but all the groups to train our students in, in leadership qualities and how to engage civilly in conversations around sensitive topics. And, and by building that network of leadership, it infiltrates and supports so many different student groups and what they expect and, and how they will respond to one another when adults aren't around, which is really what's necessary, right? right? Um, the part of the problem with the bus is it has to be peer-to-peer -peer accountability because the bus driver is not going to hear everything, right? So we have to build, and yes, when the bus driver hears something, you know, what are, do we have avenues in place for them to be successfully yeah. follow through? Absolutely. We certainly do have avenues in place, but there's one bus driver at the front of the bus and there's however many kids on that bus, mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. and they're not going to, be able to drive that bus and pay attention to everything going on. So it is about students expecting each other to rise up and be civil with one another. And the only way we can do that is if we can continue to work on building an appropriate and effective culture. Agreed. Yeah, I, I agree with what you say, but um, don't all the buses have uh, cameras and Oh, and Diane, audio. the number of hours that we, our administrators, including transportation, watch video and audio and follow up on complaints mm. is enormous, yes. absolutely excessive. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, so and fun. they don't do other things because of it. Right. So it is certainly a priority that they take, that they take this very seriously. Um, one of many. I they have say, other right? jobs. But I don't, I, I, I agree with what you're doing here totally. But uh, I, I just, I fear students having to run the gauntlet until they get to the building where the other adults and, and people are assisting them, supporting them, being with them, commute, learning communication. But that if, if the bus ride is a horror, Right. That and then I guess day. the thought I have is, what is the solution? Well, I, I think one of the things you mentioned, the consequences, there can be consequences. Well, we have consequences, but we can't speak to you about what the consequences are that a child gets. You can't tell us. I can what? tell you what the consequences are listed. Generally, I can't tell you yeah. who gets what yeah. for well, an incident. No, no yeah. one would ever ask Yeah, that, I don't think. Well, yeah. yeah, but one of the consequences is they become in front of the board for an expulsion hearing. If it gets that bad, mm -hmm. yep. And yep. some of the things that, and, and I, I don't always, I don't blame the children completely, the students. I, if they, we have them six hours a day, maybe seven, mom and dad's got them the rest of the time or mom has them or dad has them. And if they hear it at home, what do we expect? I mean, and I don't know how to break, you talk about breaking the cycle, but if we break it, at home, at school, and then it gets reinforced at home. How do we, yeah, I don't know on the committee, but it just, yeah. it drives me nuts how we so, break that. So that, right, that, that this has been the world as we've known it forever. Yeah. Um, students do know how to shift right. <laughs> based on expectations set in different settings. They, for, right. with a yes. few exceptions, they really do. Um, <clears throat> And you know some of its consistency on our part. Um, some of it, a lot of stuff happens outside of school. Um, and granted, we take care of it in school because as soon as it mm -hmm. has some implication on their educational experience, then we are mandated to follow up, even if it was an outside of school experience. There is significant follow up. And some of the the. Um uh, the first word that comes to my head is racial slurs, but I know it's many other groups. It's LGBTQ, it's disabled, whatever. Um, all of the, all of that um, has to be dealt is is becoming, depending on what state you live in, everything against the law. And we have a a, a main civil rights law that was put out in I believe 2014 that said any of those types of things that I just mentioned. 
are illegal and a couple in Jonesport was just walking, a, a mixed race couple, and um, they were harassed by someone with a, aiming a gun at them and that was a little different than, um, and um, it's being brought before the Attorney General. The, I know you don't want to, you know, say this is what will happen to you and everything, well, but they I, should know that they're leading that way. So the students are made aware. I mean, it's uh -huh. in the student handbook. The it's the yeah. handbooks are taught at the beginning of every year. The, the, none of this is secret. I think what I'm struggling with is this is a curriculum committee meeting and what I can do is the teaching and learning. And my job is to show you how we're creating educational experiences that support the front loading, the proactive side, Which rather than the reactive side. The reactive side really comes out of a different space, but I can put a note in here on for plan, plan for areas of focus in the curriculum committee this year. In what ways does this, your curiosity around consequences and next steps connect to curriculum and maybe have a meeting that focuses on that. I have to put my head wrap around, my head around that a little bit, but um, it's certainly a possibility. Okay. Um, but well, like accountability, but it, Diane, is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Well, but remember yeah, like sure. you hire administrators to do that work and you set mm -hmm. policy that right. enables that those procedures mm -hmm. to be set in the yeah. handbooks for them to follow and yeah. they are. So we just have to be careful about what our role is here. Right. Um, so I, I just, I am going to move us forward just because, okay. um, we are running out of time, but I'm hearing what you're saying. And if there's an avenue for that, Alyssa, and I will talk about it in our next agenda setting meeting and think about how to, um, consider the role that it plays within the curriculum committee and, and maybe bring an idea forward around that. Thank you. Okay. So then th there's two other things on our um, agenda. One is the this year's assessment schedule. So this is really just an FYI because I follow all the rules that we're <laughs> expected to follow around this. But um, I do want to uh share with you two things. one thing actually I think if I can find the right tab I'm gonna get out of this and try this again there we go so I was going to go out today, but we lost power here in this office for a little while due to yep. transformer being exploding or something. Yep. So really? it's it's gonna go out tomorrow, but every year it's a requirement to send out an, a letter about our state required assessments. So I've given you a copy, that letter will go out to all the families tomorrow, it's dated today, so I might change the date, but, um, and it just outlines what those assessments are. Um, and we're using NWEA again, but the, uh, a test called through year instead of math, it's not that different. Um, but just so you know, this document is also shared with you. It's on the screen. Um, we have a series of state, but we also have local universal screeners. A universal screener is basically just a tool to help us gauge where are their learners based on their grade level and age. and what kind of information can we gather about them that can help us inform our instruction and their readiness for grade level learning over time, okay? And if something shows up as exceptional or not so exceptional, we, can, we have tools that we can use with those students to get a little more information and make an instructional plan that's more responsive, okay? So it just shows you here that fall, winter, and spring, we are part of the state assessment called NUIA. And then if a student um, is a multi-language learner, they take something called ACCESS in the middle of the year, the English language proficiency assessment that's required. If they're one of the 1%, the students who, can, who, who qualify to not take the NWEA and instead go through like a portfolio process with a special education teacher, only 1% of our population can qualify. It's most significantly cognitively delayed students typically. Mm -hmm. um, they go to what we call an MSAA alternate assessment and their window is in, the, in March. The science assessment is in the spring for grades five, eight in high school, third year in high school. 
And then sometimes we're selected for what they call a NAEP assessment, National mm. Assessment of Educational Progress in Reading and Math and Now Science. Um, and funny. interestingly, Pittston and the middle school got selected again. Oh, again. They get selected almost every year except for say. last year. Yeah. <laughs> Fourth wow. grade and eighth grade. So huh. that's not on here because they haven't given us the dates yet. It'll oh, be lovely. in January. <laughs> so another agency makes those decisions. Yeah, and they actually come in and do the assessment. We can't touch anything. We just have to give them the students' time. Wow. So yeah. through the state. Uh huh. Through yeah. the state. All right. And then at the below that are the ones that are local. So early bird. That's just. Um, a, a game-based literacy screener. It's been hugely helpful to us. I ready math, concepts of print. That's like, can they hold the book upright? Do they know it goes left or right? Is there an illustrator? That kind of thing. Dibbles is that oral reading fluency we're trying to understand. Um, writing samples, all things that you typically do and it's built into their instructional day. Okay, so this is coming up. And then the last thing, and then we're just about done. Yep. Um, is if you, I'm hoping I can do this right. Oops, Terry's not in the room, so we'll see how good, <laughs> good I am. So it'll be this. flawless. Um, share that. Here's our website. And if you're going to schools and you go to central office, ta -da, there we are. Aww. And then you go to explore. There's all kinds of things to explore. Yes. A um, couple of things to pay attention to is, um, well, here's how we use our funds up here, federal right. funds, right here, accountability, testing for families. If families want more than what this page is, and I think I, I did link it in this letter that people will get electronically, they can go here. I know it's crazy to read online, but you'll get the concept. Um, it's a little description of all the assessments, when we do them, what's the purpose, what do we use the results for. This is local and state, so not just the state ones. And then down here, FAQs around state standardized assessments, why do we do them, what's the data, all kinds of answers to that. The letter that we're going to send out this week and the data dashboard. What does the date state say about our data? Where do we stand? Mm -hmm. Okay, and you can navigate that by district. Um, so this is all available for families to have more information and for us to have more information about. It's updated every year. Can a parent opt out of taking some of these tests? That's a great question. You cannot opt out of the local assessments because that's really for direct instructional decision-making. Um, unless there's like a medical thing going on, then we certainly will absolutely work with any family. Um, the state assessments, the state does not support or prohibit school mm -hmm. districts from allowing an opt-out measure. In our district, we do have an opt-out measure. It's not helpful to us to have it. If we are required to have a 95% participation rate in all of the state assessments, if we don't, it is counted against us and it counts as one of the measures of us not meeting the state expectations and showing up with a red flag on the data dashboard. However, we believe in this district that there are times where families really believe it's their right to not have their child take that test. There's sometimes there's unique circumstances. We do have an opt-out procedure. It ha the family has to connect with the building administrator. They have to have a meeting virtually or in person. Our administrators have talking points <laughs> to make sure everyone is very consistent that we're not giving mixed messages about why we have these tests and what the purpose is that the family would like to use to opt out so that there's a dialogue. And then there is a form that a family can fill out and they submit before the testing window. And they, of course, could, if they're fine with the fall, but come spring, something's come up with that child, then we can do that as well. And can you tell, what was the, uh, the, the 1%, what, what does that testing look like then? If it's it's not, like a portfolio. It's like interviews and collection oh, okay, of okay. student yep. work over time like a a certain, with certain prompts that the state requires. Okay. Yep, against certain standards. Sure. 
or we, I can just speak to my daughter was out one day for a medical appointment and it was testing day. She was stressing about oh, it. Yeah. And I said, when you get back, they'll tell you if you need to take it or not. And she was like, yeah, I had to, because we had to meet the percentage, whatever yep. for eighth grade science. I think it was that. Mm-hmm. And she's like, so I just went and did it. They pulled me aside and said no. And I was like, okay. You know, like they try to, yeah, they yeah. try to make it easier for the kids yeah. for the most part. Um, we have reduced the amount of minutes that students are testing. The state has done that. The science test is still a little long. Mm-hmm. Um, but so we've also tried to be really careful about our minutes. We are not using NWEA in kindergarten this year. Oh, you said that. Yeah. We're going to just stick with our early bird game based literacy mm-hmm. screener um, and our I ready math diagnostic. Uh, special ed, where does that fall? In they the- fall into the state requirements unless they're that 1% of students who are significantly delayed or challenged in some particular way that qualifies for a portfolio. It's a state. The state requirement. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where we're at with that. And then the last thing is the ESEA performance report. I just want you to know that we submit a performance report every year. Recently, the time has changed that you submit the application for the next year. And then in the fall, you submit the performance report from the last year. Oh. So I was trying to work on it again today, and I am having trouble accessing it. So I have it ready. Um, and as soon as I can figure out how to finish uploading the information to the state site, I will submit it. It'll be ready this fall. Um, and it basically just says, here's the data um, based on the goals that we set. And here's how we used all the money, which is exactly how we intended to use the money. Yeah, perfect. So I wanted you to know about that. Um, so far, plans for future areas of focus and curriculum, I'm hearing possibly something to do with like uh, accountability. Um, uh we do have some policies to look at this year there's four uh related to teaching and learning so i'll bring those forward do you have any other areas that you would like to learn more about it's like a loaded question after we just got all the data (laughs) and you have a really good plan i'd like to learn as much as possible about special education curriculum i mean it's always been i've gone to every one of the seminars that I could at the school board conventions. Yep. And I find it was both my, I got two daughters that are both special ed teachers. We've also made a lot of changes in that area recently. So it would be a really good topic for us to explore. Mm. Um, If staff uh, are available, uh, I've always enjoyed having like when we've had, you know, the coaches come in or just kind of updates from Different people doesn't have to be the coaches, although that, that's nice yeah, too. Yeah, because we don't see them necessarily firsthand. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like call up too. Um, and anyway, yeah, just those yeah. Terms. Great class. Anybody that has something really cool going on, you know. Yeah, I wonder. To... I wonder if there might be something out of the learning themes. That's one what the I was. Might want to share oh, with you. That's a good you. idea. That's, I'm. Yeah. We've changed a lot in library services, and we added yeah. a staff member. So I, you know, but yeah. at the ed tech three yeah. level, I think there's going to be. It's a little bit of a rocky road. We have phenomenal people, but I'm concerned a little bit about if I overloaded. That's exactly. So so we might want to have that conversation before budget season. Hear what you said. I'm sorry. The library services. While we added in Ed Tech three, um, we also added roles and responsibilities. Something about a rocky road. I'm worried about if we found the balance between amount of time they can work and amount of responsibility they have. So that might be something we want to hear about before budget season. Is the um, star are the stars and autism programs part of special ed? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. We okay. This is good. I have some information to work with. You can always request again as the year goes on. Um, but I'll work with Alyssa to kind of set up a map for this, and we'll try to we'll try to move forward. Cool. Thank you very much for all the information. Yeah, we are done. Yes. Oh my God, I did not get done early. That's okay. Four thirty-eight, but we started late. It was so exactly one hour. Yeah. It was. Okay. I just wanted to make sure it was a big one. Thank you. I know we're probably still live. Thank you. Oh yeah, I don't know how to turn oh, it off. Oh God, Tony, perhaps we can just go upstairs. Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. I text you oh, while we're sitting nice. there. Wow. I, it should be a big end. Thank button. you. Thank you. <laughs> The big, the big red Thank end, you. Have a good evening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know. I know.
Thank right. you for messaging her. That oh, sure. Because uh, I just assumed it was an in-person meeting. Yeah. So here I go. Yeah. I did bring my computer.